Hi, my name is Aiden Carpenter, and I'm an intern here at the Center for Research in Vermont. Today, I'll be sitting with Michael Moser and Kelly Hamshaw and interviewing a lot of the work they do, interviewing them about the work they do with the Center for Rural Studies. Uh, really excited because the center has been shifting towards a focus more on like sustainability and diversity, and these are definitely two people I want to talk to about that. Uh, do you two have anything you want to say about yourselves, introduce yourselves, introduce the center? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, I'm Michael Moser. I'm a research specialist in the Center for Rural Studies, and I also coordinate something called the Vermont State Census Data Center, uh, which is a program of the Census Bureau um, where I, I act as a liaison between the Census Bureau and, and data users and producers here in the state of Vermont. Um, I'll just briefly talk a little bit about the Center for Rural Studies. We are a uh, nonprofit fee for service research center on the UVM campus, and we specialize in uh, c conducting uh, program evaluations, doing uh, primary data collection and um, pro, you know, whatever other um, outreach and communication processes that our clients might uh, want assistance with. We do everything from project development to management um, to uh, sort of the analysis of data and the reporting of data out afterwards. Mm -hmm. And we do this with a variety of local clients across the state of Vermont, rural municipalities, um, nonprofit service organizations and and even business entities and we also work with um, state level agencies and departments and even some federal agencies and departments and occasionally we do projects with USDA and others um, that are funded through uh, different programs okay. excellent cool. thanks Michael so I'm Kelly Hamshaw I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Community Development and Applied Economics which is closely tied um, to the Center for Rural Studies here in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at UVM um, I, gosh, I've had a long history, I, I suppose, with the center starting um, back in my graduate school days and then becoming a staff um, research specialist um, for a few years before transitioning into a primarily teaching role um, in the department, um, but have maintained uh, working with Michael and a few of our other colleagues um, over the years because it keeps me closely connected to the work um, going on in our communities across the state, which I think um, keeps our classes um, engaging and keeping um, students connected to some of that work or facilitating internships um, or bringing in some of our project partners um, into the classroom. So it's really been uh, a joy to be part of this work and be part of this team um, and work with our clients on, on as Michael described, really um, all sorts of different projects meeting needs um, on the ground um, in our communities. Yeah. Well, I guess going in to the all sorts, that's a very, vague like description so what like pull a project pick like your favorite project right now that you're working on what does that look like oh gosh a favorite project favorite project where do we even start with that michael um yeah that's that's uh um there's <laughs> we work on multiple projects at any given time and sometimes it can be a little overwhelming to be honest um but uh there is a project that um is the new project that we hope to be working on and I, I believe we're going to be um and the reason i'm choosing to talk about it rather than a project that we we already have is is the subject area is kind of fun it's actually um we're going to be um evaluating uh public perceptions around the use of e-bikes on mountain bike trails in the state of vermont and so uh, because e-bikes are uh, technically motorized, uh, they are a motorized vehicle and most of these trail networks do not allow motorized vehicles. And so we're, we're hoping to assist an organization and, the, and sort of the mountain, bike, mountain biking community to, in their understanding of how to maybe bring e-bikes into mm -hmm. these trail networks in a, a sustainable fashion. In, in a way that um, you know will increase access to those trails for folks of various abilities. That's really cool. That's exciting for me. I guess <laughs> I I bike a lot, and that's an exciting thing for me to think about. 
Um, I guess, who is that project with? Is that with like Fellowship of the Wheel, VMBA? Yeah, we, we will be working with the Vermont Mountain Bike Association and, and other uh, trail network associations at the local level and, and at the state level as well, yeah. Okay. That project really piques my interest, Michael, because I sit um, in my kind of like local resident um, in Bristol, as Ada knows. Um, I, I think I was actually instructed not to mention Bristol too much <laughs> during this interview, right? Um, as anyone who's taken my classes now knows, I'm a huge fan of Bristol, but um, one of my roles in the community is sitting on the board of a small um, community-based land trust. Um, and so we've been really, um, I don't think we've actually discussed um, the idea of e-bikes because we also have non-motorized per easements that we hold. Yeah. Um, with um, state and federal entities um, that prohibit motorized vehicles um, on that particular um, piece of land. So it raises definitely some interesting questions from my community member hat. Um, but in terms of um, you know other projects, I think, Michael, that was definitely um, something that we heard a bit um, when Amy Kelsey, who is a former um, CDA or CRS um, research specialist, we um, were um, supporting the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Rec um, with their every five years, they have to conduct a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, um, fondly called the SCORP. Um, and so we um, were able to, um, we collected um, survey data from folks all all across the state. We conducted focus groups. Um, I think um, I'm remembering one uh, particularly great outing down to Brattleboro. Um, and we worked with some, an extension colleague um, and just heard from so many folks that are very passionate about offering um, accessible recreation in their communities at the local and grassroots level. Um, and so getting to hear firsthand experiences about what community assets um, they are able to employ and making those activities available to folks and also the real challenges that they face in terms of capacity, funding um, limitations, and really uh, just astounded by the creativity and the energy and passion um, for that work um, down in Brattleboro. But I think if I think about a more current project, uh, most recently, um, Michael and I and a colleague of ours, Carrie um, Daigle, who's also a member of our CRS team, um, we've been working um, with a team over at the UVM Medical Center on their community health needs assessment. And so we've been their research partner, um, taking part in this um, cycle every three years where they have to identify what the health priorities are um, in, um, in this case, for Chittenden and Grand Isle counties. And so Michael's been leading a team looking over um, gosh, dozens and dozens of secondary health indicators drawing from um, state data sources, from census um, data sources. We had over or nearly 4,000 people um, from both counties respond to a community survey asking folks about um, their perspectives um, about health and well-being, what um, challenges they see, what actions could help improve overall health and well-being in the community. Um, that um, survey particularly, um, I think we were um, you know, really, um, really happy to partner with the medical center and their language access services team to be able to provide that in 11 different languages um, in um, um, for folks across both counties um, and being able to uh, partner with different organizations like ALV and USCRI, um, where the hospital was able to um, support um, some one on one survey um, support um, to ensure that voices who aren't typically heard um, in surveys like that were captured. Um, and so that's um, you know, a really big, complex project that we've been working on uh, with a team approach um, over the past it's almost I think we're coming up on a year now. Um, and so we have over 25 different community organizations that have been involved in that as part of the steering committee. And so we've also been providing um, steering committee support um, from a project management side of things. We've conducted focus groups. Um, that was actually, I think, my first return um, to in-person um, research activities um, this past November. So getting to conduct focus group with a group of seniors um, at one of our senior living communities here in Burlington. Um, that was really um, quite a joy, um, joyful activity, actually, um, despite sometimes the heavy um, subject matter we were talking about in terms of hearing about the impacts of isolation um, on our older community members um, throughout the pandemic, but also how they um, 
we're able to um, support each other and um, support the staff um, and the different resources that have been, um, you know, supporting everybody um, throughout this. Um, and then, um, let's see, what else did we do, Michael? We interviewed um, some experts um, and community leaders, um, so about 40 of those um, across the two counties. And so really getting a sense of what folks are seeing in, on their work on the ground um, in terms of what's driving health and well-being and ways that we can improve. Um, because that's really the whole um, mission behind this effort is trying to identify where those disparities are and then how can we target investments in those areas um, to improve um, people's um, ability to have healthy, um, well um, lives. And so we're just getting to really now um, reporting on everything um, that we've um, collected over the past year. Um, we had two virtual um, community prioritization sessions in January that we had over or maybe like 150 people about um, participate in those and helping us really hone in on on what those are um, and so those will be moving forward um, and continuing in that process shortly but we're now we're getting into the writing phase which is um, really exciting and meeting with designers and trying to think about how do we um, share the res results in ways that are engaging um, and accessible um, and putting that back in the hands of the community so I guess that's a favorite project because it's one that is um, very much top of mind um, right now. Well, no, that's good. I think I appreciate you going so in depth because it gives, like going back to what Michael was saying about like, you guys kind of do everything. You hit like 15 different points about what you all are doing in this one project to make it work. And I think that's so cool. Um, but I guess I do want some clarification of like, what do you all do? So like at base, it starts <laughs> out. Well, no. no, I love it, Aiden. This is this is great. Because I think there's, of course, like the in theory, this is what we're doing. And right. in theory, like I feel like in talking to you all, a lot of the work is more focused around the community interaction and trying to get like feedback and information from the community. Mm -hmm. But we're so where does your participation with that end? Does it, is it supposed to stop at like the data stage after you all do some analysis on it? Or do you all normally follow through? Um, oftentimes what the client's needs are. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would suggest though that to some extent we want to remain as sort of more neutral researchers that provide access to information. So we assist people to find the answers, uh, to find out answers to the questions they have. So we hand them the information that they can then take out and utilize to do informed decision making. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's not necessarily our role to, to make the decisions or to implement policies or planning or, or whatever the process is, but rather to enable others that are you know, operating in those areas that are the subject matter experts that are the professionals that have years of experience with whatever the subject is, you know, rural livelihoods or healthcare in Vermont, we, we enable them to make decisions with, with, by putting good data in their hands and good information in their hands and, and giving their program, you know, giving them the information about their programs or about the public and, and what the public needs and wants. And, and so that's from, from my perspective, that's, that's how I feel about it. Now, of course, we will communicate results and we will communicate to, you know, uh, executive boards and to the public about the results um, and, and, you know, shout from the rooftops what the results are if, if, if that's what we're supposed to do. But um, ultimately, I think from my perspective anyway, implementation is up to the folks that uh, mm -hmm. we, we are helping. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, you know, in terms of Michael um, saying like it really depends on the project in terms of like our extent to which we're, we're maybe collecting the data, doing the analysis and providing a simple report um, or some more complicated, complex analysis back um, to our clients and our partners. Um, or it really is kind of going the full um, cycle um, with the with the partner with the client to bring that information back to the community. Um, I think another project that I, we recently completed was with the Charlotte Land Trust. Um, 
And so a team of us um, over the past year or half or so have um, conducted farmer interviews. Um, we had a farmer survey that went out about um, just trying to understand what the landscape looks like around agriculture in a rather uh, rural community here in Chittenden County. Um, with uh, that faces a lot of um, pressure um, from Burlington um, in terms of development. And so really thinking around um, creatively with this, the board of a, of a small um, and very um, committed nonprofit to help them think through like what's on people's minds, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what's working well, um, and then have that inform, as Michael said, their next step in their decision making process. So I think part of those conversations was also caveating or, or talking about the limitations of some of the available data. So, for example, um, some of the secondary data that we collected um, for on behalf of this project is collected by the USDA um, on a I think a cycle of every five years, um, seven years. Um, and so some of that data in between those cycles, right, um, can be um, fairly dated just because of the lag time. Um, and so watching those trends kind of generally over time, but maybe you don't want to make decisions on data from that last report out when you're getting to the end um, of that cycle before the new data comes out. And so we try to do, I would say, some capacity building around like, how can you work with the data? Um, what maybe are some of the limitations or the boundaries that you just want to be aware of in terms of, um, you know, really understanding what um, what maybe a survey done on um, one particular day or one particular month, especially in, I, I would say, the context of COVID, um, you know, what that can tell you and what it can't tell you, um, and then make the best informed decisions um, moving from there. But we're happy to be thought partners with folks um, yeah. in, that, um, in that vein as well. Yeah, with, without a doubt, I think thought partner is a, is a good way to describe it, Kelly. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I, I, I would also like to mention that um, I would say that Kelly and I are both also, uh, you know, well-trained in community development and uh, practitioners of community development and um, teachers about community development. And so we, we can, we do bring uh, a certain expertise to the table with any of our clients. Sometimes that community de development perspective is, is completely appropriate to the client's needs. And sometimes it's less appropriate, but most of the time, I, I think that we can, you know, assist with our knowledge of communities and of, you know, you know, the way things work in rural communities and in Vermont communities, um, you, you know, we we can bring that expertise to the table. We also have uh, knowledge of the networks in the state of Vermont as well, which I, I think is an incredibly valuable uh, skill set to have or, or um, information to have about how uh, organizations work together uh, and within state government across sectors like the nonprofit sector and, and state government and all the sectors. So, so we, we can bring some really uh, useful uh, knowledge and, and skill sets that um, usually relate to what the client's needs are. And, and as Kelly was saying, I think we could be thought partners in, in those ways. Okay. Then I guess, if you were to define your role in the community in terms mm -hmm. of why you all, like I know, of course, the whole idea is we want to go and make this information more available to these mm -hmm. like organizations so they can do their work. But why is that important for you all to do? That's an excellent question, Aiden. Um, for me, I think it's about you know, I, I feel like making good on the opportunities that I've had to come to an institution like UVM for my undergraduate and my graduate work um, and sharing that knowledge um, as best I can in terms of uh, whether it's working with organizations or working with some of these institutions that are so important, right, to the quality of life of our communities, like our local hospitals. Um, we're actually working in two community health needs assessments right now. Um, and you know, some of these other like organizations that we've had the privilege um, and frankly joy um, of working to support is that it, it feels like a great way to be able to pay that forward. Um, and it's, it can be really rewarding in terms of, uh, you know, being able to look back and be like, oh yeah, we worked on, on that sport, for example, and now seeing where funding is being allocated, um, you know, 
down the road. Or um, I, I would imagine with this community health needs assessment, um, when that's finalized and looking at where some of those projects over the next three years are going to trace back um, to, to the priorities that we helped um, to identify through our mixed methods approach um, from the focus groups, the interviews, the surveys, the secondary data, um, you know, and engaging community members in that work. Um, I, I find it just personally rewarding um, and that it really um, always like the application of the tools we learn here um, in um, one of my least favorite words, I'll say like the academy, right? And kind of breaking up the four walls um, or the walls of, you know, of, of an institution like, um, like a university to be able to share that um, with folks on the ground and have that actually like, mean something um, in terms of informing directions, informing investments, um, and helping make that tangible change in that way. Yeah, that's that, that's great, Kelly. Um, I, I would agree with all, all of that. Um, Vermont is, is my home state, and the reason that I um, found myself in uh, studying community development at the University of Vermont is because I, I cared so deeply about the state and mm -hmm. was seeing changes in the state and and was 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 knowledgeable about some of the challenges that were being experienced by people in the state. And so I found myself wanting to find ways that I could answer questions or or you know, facilitate change that was positive and sustainable for people, for Vermonters. And um, so I got involved in community development and, and began working at the Center for Rural Studies. And it's, it's absolutely that exactly. It's about helping Vermont communities and Vermonters to have the best possible outcomes, whether it be economic outcomes or social outcomes or, mm -hmm. you know, what, whatever those be, um, you know, we can be there as facilitators of those conversations and facilitators of those processes that will enable hopefully Vermonters to to have you know live better lives and, and just increase the quality of life here for for everyone ideally this is what we're trying to do and um, you know we, we do that in our projects every day whether it's um, you know a project to understand uh, the Another project we're working on right now is, is looking at the transition from dairy farms to, or from traditional uh, cow dairy farms to potentially, you know, what's the potential to transition those farms to goat dairy farms? Is there a new type of agriculture uh, that we can transition to? What's that gonna look like? How can we facilitate those transitions so that we just don't have a bunch of abandoned cow dairy farms and open land that is, that is, you know, left to go fallow. We we really want to maintain that agricultural heritage in the working landscape, and so we can we partner with, you know, the USDA and with partners in UVM Extension and others to really, you know, study these problems and and come up with ideas for solutions and test those solutions as well. And again, that could be that could be you know our agricultural heritage. It could be the vibrancy of our local communities and the economic development and uh, service provision within our, our village centers uh, and, and the infrastructure needed to serve all Vermonters at the, at the, you know, in particular, the Vermonters that are at the farthest reaches of our communities that are mm -hmm. the most rural Vermonters and ensuring that they have access to um, economic opportunity and to healthcare access and to mm -hmm. social opportunities as well as the folks that are, you know, in Chittenden County or or in our more urban areas as well. So, really, it's it's um, I'm always grateful that I'm able to work for CRS and with CRS to to impact the lives of Vermonters. That that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> what is sort of the fun thing? Beautiful, inspirational, inspiring, but no, that's very touching. I think from both of you about just being able to do things with where you are in life and being able to actually impact people is so beautiful. Thank you. Michael and I are actually both on the planning committee for um, an international conference that was supposed to come to UVM in 2020, but um, COVID delays. Um, so this coming August, we actually have um, colleagues from around the world who are going to be hopefully knock on wood, um, traveling to Burlington for the International Equality, uh, International Society for the Quality of Life Studies Conference um, that we're going to host here on campus. And so I think right now we're at about 250 different scholars have submitted abstracts 
from really this um, very transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach to thinking about quality of life. So we have folks who come from more planning disciplines and look at geographers, um, but we also have sociologists and psychologists and political scientists, um, everyone thinking about um, from the medical field, even um, really thinking about what is it, what's it take to have a high quality of life um, and using different lenses uh, from around the world. And so we're really um, looking forward to welcoming everyone um, and sharing what we love um, about Vermont um, to a new group of folks, um, hopefully in early August. Well, that actually transitions great. I was just about to ask if you have any projects or anything else going on you want to highlight. I mean, that's- That's not even a CRS project, technically. That's like our service. Just no. that. <laughs> I think it's a it's a range. It could be a personal project. I don't know. Do you have any personal Bristol projects you want to highlight? Oh my gosh! Well, um, Bristol. I'll just I'll give a shout out to Bristol. Um, and Aiden, you already heard this in class this week, but um, you know, this past weekend we. Oh wait, hang on. I have a prop. Oh. <laughs> we have um. Bristol is known for it's like, I would say it's small downtown businesses and uh, particularly women owned businesses. We have quite the collection of uh, female led businesses um, in our downtown. Um, and so the latest addition to that is um, V Smiley uh, Jams, um, who's been, they've been producing um, their own jams for quite some time um, in New Haven um, and actually in Bristol in a production space has um, recently just taken over um, what was the Bristol um, bakery and cafe space. Um, right in the heart of the downtown and this past weekend, um, they held their first open house um, and to see that life come back to our downtown and people, neighbors seeing each other for maybe the first time um, in, in a while, it's been a long winter. Um, and just the joy of uh, biscuits griddled with jam on them um, and people just um, checking out a new space. Um, we have, um, you know, now there's like all these wonderful, there's a little mini grocery with local um, agricultural products, um, food products being sold uh, right in the heart of Bristol. Um, and folks are just so excited um, to, to be able to welcome back energy to that space. Um, and so hopefully, um, I think they're planning on opening fairly soon, as soon as they can staff up um, some more. So um, yeah, the Smiley, it's um, called the Mini Factory in downtown Bristol. Um, so I serve as a board member of the Bristol Corps, which is a designated downtown program. Um, that serves Bristol. There are um, about 24 designated downtowns or 26 now um, around the state of Vermont. And so that's a program um, hosted um, by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And Gary Holloway is a wonderful asset um, in that department or in that agency that helps steward those and support those. Um, so we have so many wonderful downtowns in addition to Bristol, of course, across the state. Um, but Bristol is clearly near and dear to my heart. Um, it's just so many good things happening. So we're looking forward to hopefully getting back to more of a uh, normal event schedule um, over the summer um, and to the fall. So yeah, pretty right. excited about that. It's fun. Michael, any projects for you or? Um, I, I just, you know, like to mention again, the, the state data center, which is the mm -hmm. Census Bureau activity here in the state of Vermont. Uh, that always really excites me because it's it's really about the demographics of our state and understanding how those change over time and and how you know we can we can look at our communities through so many different lenses and and we have access to so much information about our communities uh, you know it's not just you know whether the population is increasing or decreasing but you know we we can we can narrow that lens and look at you know how people in poverty are faring who the people are ex are that are experiencing poverty what's going on in our communities are we experiencing higher rates of of homelessness or or housing insecurity are we you know are we experiencing increasing or decreasing crime rates all of these data are so important. They, they indicate what's happening in our communities and across our state. And I, I just think it's so important to, for Vermonters to have awareness about some of those data points and, and the indications that we can, we can utilize to understand what's going on and, and help us make decisions. And that's what, you know, not only the state data center, but most of our clients are interested in, in understanding something about the communities and, and, understanding what the trends are. And I, I just think that's very important and, and just wanted to emphasize that again. Mm -hmm. Very important. Thank you. Thank you both for joining me. It's been so fun having you.
to the audience, thank you for joining us. This has been a fun interview. Sorry we started a little bit late. I'll try next week. We'll got to keep a schedule. So <laughs> next week, uh, interview with Pablo Bose, where we'll talk about some of his work with migrants here and really excited. Thank you all again. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much, Aiden.